I'd like to take the distinct pleasure of introducing Barbara Berry from the National Gallery. Barbara's been at the National Gallery since 1984 in October 2013, she was appointed head of the scientific research department. She supervises a staff comprising of up to 12 members at one time. I don't know how she sleeps either. That includes scientists, fellows, and interns who provide support to conservation and curatorial departments in addition to undertaking research in cultural heritage science. Current research projects include investigating metal soap formation in paint films, developing soft matter, gels, and gel-like materials for cleaning works of art, identifying innovative use of materials by early modern artists, and the study of artists' use of a color theory in their work. She edited the fourth volume of the highly regarded and really used daily series, Artist Pigments. And she was also the co-organizer of an extremely influential symposium, the Arthur M. Sackler Colloquium, name certain to be changed soon, um, Scientific Examination of Art, Modern Techniques in Conservation and Analysis. So Barbara's going to be talking about Aris Kent Still Lives, wonderful title, His Molecular Existence and Others of His Elk. Please join me in welcoming Barbara. All right, so I don't have a single note, and I don't have presenter mode here either. So uh, we're going to just all be in this together. And you and I are at a distinct disadvantage because we have not read that book on metal soaps yet. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but it's, it's a, uh, you yeah. I um, titled my talk before I realized that Petria Noble was going to be here, but we agreed that I could leave it. But the point of bringing up this particular image and uh, is that we see the picture of a dead person, but molecularly underneath all kinds of chemistry is happening. But also this particular image comes from CNE News and Francesca just showed it as well. And part of the uh, motivation for using this is to um, recognize that scientists out there outside the museum world also find this very interesting. And so I think there's good synergy here for us to be able to, to um, Get, get a larger view of how active paintings are, as well as other objects, which I will show in, at, the, at the end of the talk. So um, Francesca actually told you all about all of this, but about how um, oil cross-links and polym polymerizes. Um, it doesn't form a long polymer. It forms an, a network of polymers, and in fact, often um, polymer scientists will describe linseed oil as an oligomer because it's not very long chain and this gives a wonderful plastic material that uh, can actually move a little bit too. So it's not just the chemistry that's active, it's the physicality of these paint films that are active as well. Sometimes for better, sometimes for worse. But of course paints have a colorant in them as well. And uh, it's that colorant that can lead to metal soap formation. So we have these beautiful pinwheel-shaped um, triglycerides that come from the oil. But uh, over at some point, they can hydrolyze, and maybe before they cross-link, but maybe after. And uh, a, a, a fatty acid anion splits off. And Sometimes, and Francesca already alluded to this, that there may be a dissolution of a pigment, perhaps because of the presence of water. And we might only need a monolayer of water for this kind of reaction to happen. So it could be happening in a, in a hydrophobic oil paint film simply because there's enough water on surfaces for that reaction to happen. So just possibly a pigment will dissolve just a little bit in, in the paint film. And if that metal ion sees that free fatty acid anion, they can react and form that salt, which is the metal soap. So it's actually a very simple chemical reaction. It's the kind of reaction that you're taught in, in your first year of chemistry class, and yet it has such interesting consequences for what's happening in, in paint films. Um, some years ago, I had a wonderful postdoc, Margaret MacDonald, who's now um, working in, in, in the army doing single-sided NMR mouse research, 
but also teaching one day, uh, one day a week at MICA. So she's keeping her art science thing together. But she wrote a report at the end of her fellowship that said, um, some debate remains in the mechanism of formation and whether soaps are a long-term and preventable degradation phenomenon or if they happen early in the curing process. And I think that's another important thing is to figure, for us to figure out whether, whether when, and how these, um, these reactions occur in, in all works, some works, when they get damp. And so Margaret actually developed a very simple uh, set of experiments, but very nice, um, that was to look at a competition between oligomerization or curing of, of, of an unsaturated fatty acid and the soap formation. And she used a model that um, has been described in the literature and is very well accepted, where ethyl linoleate stands in for linseed oil. Because linseed oil is very complex, and if we're trying to watch what's going on, we really need to kind of get to the essentials and make things as simple as we can. So she took uh, ethyl linoleate and dissolved it in methanol, and methyl acetates, which are also soluble in methanol, and mixed the two solutions. And it's that it was that simple. And this work is actually published, so I'm not going to go into all of the details. But I will show you the pictures of the results. And this is what forms almost as soon as you add lead acetate to a methanolic solution of ethyl linoleate. These remarkable structures. Um, in the top, it's transmitted uh, light. And um, on the bottom is as polarized light microscopy. And there are all these little round spheres that are actually spherulites that have an incredibly complex structure. There's remarkable complexity and um, form developed from just mixing two rather simple compounds. And very, very soon after they form, while the ethyl linoleate is still liquid and there's still some methanol around, they start to aggregate very quickly. And you can see in this SEM image how they all bunch together and come forming a, a huge uh, lump. And they each lose their individual form, and we don't can't see inside what's going on underneath this big lump. And it doesn't, the, the aggregation keeps going very quickly. And um, on your right-hand side, you can see the image of how these spherulites have all aggregated together after only about 60 hours. So they're, they're, they all want to come together. And of course, in a, an, uncured methanolic um, solution, there's rapid mobility of all of these particles, which is a little bit different from in a paint film. And Francesca talked about time. So if so, but it doesn't mean that things can't move. You know, things are moving in the wall. Um, you, if you have enough time, something can go a very long way. But in only 60 hours, we can go this far. And that looks remarkably like a pustule in a, in a painting. And the same thing happens in, um, for, for mixing ethyl linoleate with zinc acetate. The compounds that formed have a different structure. They're much more lamellar. But these beautiful spherulites uh, form right away. And then they aggregate over time. And sometimes they bunch up and then collapse down like a crater and that you can see on your, on your right-hand side. So, um, and, and then another image of the zinc linoleate. But by this time, it's not zinc linoleate. We actually don't know exactly what it is, but by this time, the linoleate ligand is oxidizing. So it already has, has some oxide bonds that can cross-link and start reacting with other um, zinc linoleate sorts of species. And down in the lower half of this image, you can see what uh, the aggregate looks like under fluorescence um, imaging uh, microscopy. And it actually does fluoresce. Ordinary simple salts do not fluoresce. So just the observation of fluorescence tells us that we have much more structure than we thought we were going to have from a simple salt formation reaction. Um, if we look at the uh, IR spectrum, the FTIR spectrum, it's an ATR spectrum, 
of these two salts. The red spectrum is the spectrum that we observe right away as soon as the samples are mixed and those first spherulites are formed. And the black spectrum is taken about 10 days later. And on your, your left is lin lead linoleate, but remember, it's not linoleate anymore, but we don't actually know for sure exactly what it is. And on the right is zinc linoleate. And if we look at the spectra that have developed after only 10 days, you, those of you who will see the book will be able to compare these to the uh, FTR spectra that are obtained from protrusions and paint films from uh, real paintings. And the, there, are, uh, there is a feature, and I think this will get lost, but inside those blue um, ovals are the features that we see frequently in FTIR spectra of, of paint films. And these are due to the soaps that form, the metal carboxylates. And I just would like to point out that the IR spectrum of the zinc um, linoleate is very, very similar to that that's found in the Van Gogh painting. And yet it's not the complex material that we think is forming in a real painting because we used only ethyl linoleate and zinc acetate to make that. So this gives us some insight into the complexity of the materials, but maybe also something about their simplicity too that we're overlooking. But the complexity is beautiful. And actually, Jen did ask me to talk about these. So the complexity of these materials is that they seem to relate to metal organic framework complexes. These, uh, these are formed from the reaction of metal ions with uh, carboxylate anions. And they're the subject of intense research because they have catalytic properties. They can uh, absorb hydrogen, they can absorb acetone, and the reason they can do all of these things is that they have big holes in their lattice. So molecules can move in and be stored there or do reactions there. They have long two-dimensional or even three-dimensional structure that gives them fluorescence properties. These are the structures of two lead carboxylate species that are fluorescent. And that also tells us something about the, uh, the way that um, electrons and, and materials are carried through and why these materials are so stable. Because there are lower electron bonds and everything, energy is reduced by this beautiful crystalline form. Um, interestingly, uh, zinc azelate creates a very stable complex just zinc and azelaic acid. Azelaic acid is present in, in oil films as a, a, a scission product as the oil paint ages. But a simple reaction of just those two materials gives a complex that's, shows, that's being studied at great lengths because it shows good um, antibacterial properties. So there's a lot of, of research out there in other fields that helps us understand these materials. And this is a very stable material showing great promise as a, as a therapeutic. Um, but it's not just zinc and lead, which the field has mostly focused on that form these complexes. And within the scientific literature, there's a lot of evidence that many other uh, metal ions do too. And metal ions that are of relevance to our studies and our thoughts about degradation, change, alteration, aging in paintings, including manganese and cadmium and calcium. Um, and of course, zinc, zinc is back there again because it, it's um, studied a great deal. So we, we should not just think about this as an exceptional process, but maybe a constant process. And, uh, and, and what we need to do is think about what initiates it and whether these give us a more stable material or a less stable material. I think one of the issues might be that if we start forming these very large lattice complexes, they take up a much larger volume than the salts did originally. And that's where the problem is. And it's not that there's instability from a chemical point of view, but the physical space that's required for these um, molecules might be, be the issue. So moving from simple models, 
which I think are incredibly revealing, to something that's a little closer to an artwork, the National Gallery of Art has a collection of artist materials. Most of the paints are in tubes, but we also have a marvelous set of paintouts from the Grumbacher factory that were made in 1994. And among that large set of materials, we have uh, Grumbacher's soft titanium white. Um, and on this paintout, which was made using a drawdown bar to give a paint film that's about the same thickness as a typical artist's paint film and was put onto an, a, an artist support. In this particular case, it's was called the traditional artist support. So it's a zinc oxide um, ground in oil. And so this gives us something that is remarkably similar to an artist painting, just without any composition. Maybe we can call it white on white. <laughs> But we have the formulary cards for these as well, which is a remarkably good thing. So we know what is in this paint. And actually, Robin Hodgkins, who was um, a fellow at the gallery a few years ago, analyzed uh, the organic materials of these using gas chromatography and mass spectrometry. And, and so we know extremely well the, what's in this paint at, at this current time. And in fact, the, her results show that uh, the formulary card is right. We have the poppy seed sunflower seed and uh, oil, and we have aluminum tristerate. Now, aluminum tristerate is added to paints for a variety of reasons, some practical and, and some from the desirable pro uh, properties. The addition of this compound keeps the uh, pigment in suspension, and Francesca talked about how that was done in Ripollin. Um, but if you're not going to take the time to pre-age or treat your, your, paint, uh, your paint, you might just add aluminum uh, tristerate to keep your, your pigment from flocking. But the aluminum tristerate also adjusts the rheology of the paint so that the artist pushing this under the brush gets a paint that moves beautifully. Um, so it's, it's scumbleable, as they, as they used to say. Um, but the addition of that material does influence soap formation. And that's being studied now by Xiao Ma, who's our current fellow at the National Gallery, who's done a great deal of work and just written this up. Uh, he had the idea of looking at um, the IR spectrum of a tube of paint that had never been opened. And so this is a tube of paint that has the same formulation as our paint outs. And opening it for the first time and getting the IR spectrum, you can see that um, it's, we still have unsaturated fatty acids, but down there in the carboxylate region, we can see the, uh, uh, an absorption at 1588 for aluminum stearate. But you can see that already in the paint film, in the paint tube, before it's even come out of the tube, zinc stearate has formed. So there's already activity or reaction in that tube. So the zinc stearate here is not an additive because we have the formulary card. It's actually formed by reaction between the zinc oxide pigment and the aluminum stearate. Um, we've done quite a bit of um, analysis of, of what this material looks like in the paint out now. On the, on the Top left, you can see the cross section that we took from the paint out. Um, we've done SEM, so we know the system very well. The um, golden colored slice is uh, a micro CT scan, which we um, took, uh, actually deal with Parkinson at the uh, advanced light source, uh, did this work. As what we were interested in was to see the distribution of materials, of low density materials within, the, within that paint film. The backscattered electron image on, the, on your far right shows little dark spots that are the aluminum stearate widely distributed among the, the uh, paint chip. What we wanted to know was whether our single section there was representative of the whole. So we have the 3D image and we, can, we did thresholding and we know that the aluminum stearate is randomly distributed throughout the paint film. The, um, Little globules, those low density globules, look like the uh, image with the red square in the middle uh, down on the bottom right hand corner. 
And uh, the EDS spectrum of that contains some zinc. Now, you all know that the um, analysis volume of EDX can be quite large, but the zinc definitely is in the middle of the aluminum stearate mixture. So this does tie back to the IR. But uh, we wanted to know a little bit more about exactly what that phase was in there. So with, um, in collaboration with scientists at NIST and, the, and Andrea Centrone's group, we undertook some photothermal IR investigation. Now this is an AFM-based um, technique. Um, it's a little bit like the technique that Francesca was talking about, where she's going to try to look at using um, Teres Raman so that, uh, to look at the very fine distribution of materials. So using this technique, we can get an IR spectrum from an area that's just nanometers uh, large. So our spatial resolution in the XY direction is extremely high. So, um, and I'm not going to go into the technique here, but we can obtain point spectra and we can map with this system. Now, all of you who work with these kinds of materials know that they are actually quite soft by comparison to a lot of the materials that are using. So these data were obtained in tapping mode for those of you who are, who are asking. I'll already answer that question. The, um, what we do see on mapping is that we can see that there's, there's oil fairly widely distributed, but you can see it as the bright spots in the top right hand um, image. In um, the square labeled F, uh, which also gives us the locations of all of the spectra that are on the left-hand side that I'll, I'll just talk briefly about in a second, you can see that there's um, a high intensity for a peak at 1590. That 1590 peak is associated with the broad carboxylate of zinc um, soaps. So not zinc stearate but the kind of peak that zinc carboxylate in paintings has, or the kind of peak that the zinc linoleate had. Um, in the box next to it, box G, we're mapping the distribution of intensity of a band at 1540, and that's the peak that belongs to zinc stearate. And remember, we already knew there was zinc stearate um, in, in a paint tube, but here, and we assume that it's due, it forms from the reaction of aluminium stearate with zinc stearate. But here we can see that it's forming at the edges of, of the aluminium stearate globule. Um, this had been shown by Francesca Gabarelli in Costanza Miliani's lab before. But here we see something a little more um, insightful because what we're actually seeing is aggregation of the zinc stearate around the aluminium stearate globule. And what we're finding from the um, uh, distribution of peaks and the point IR is that inside the aluminium stearate globule, we're finding that zinc carboxylate that looks like an oil zinc complex. So the distribution of the materials is not what we expected at all. We were expecting more zinc stearate inside the globule and um, zinc carboxylate, that broad zinc carboxylate, outside. But actually, somehow, inside that globule, we've got the complex, more complex zinc salts occurring. Um, we know that because of the, the, of the IR spectra that we've, we've obtained from points in there. So what we can see from this is that um, we've got a lot of kinds of different kinds of, of materials being formed, but also we can see these things that are formed are on the move. And, um, and they move in interesting ways. So now I want to just talk about what that might look like on a work of art. Now, um, we have at the gallery the Degas waxes, <laughs> The, the objects from which all the bronzes that you see everywhere were, were cast. These, um, some of these were made with a clay called plastilina, which is a mixture of zinc oxide, um, tallow or lard, or oleic acid with clay. 
And that's just like paint, except that the oil isn't a drying oil. So that gives us the same situation that you set up um, in, a, in a paint tube, except that we don't have drying. So everything is still mobile. And here you can see those fatty acids and uh, coming to the surface of, of the plastilina objects. Um, I don't think there's much we can do about it, but it's happening uh, so much that we often get calls from visitors to tell us that our waxes are melting, <laughs> which they aren't. It's OK. You know, it's an aesthetic issue now. I mean, obviously, it's a structural issue as well as an aesthetic issue. Um, I had hoped to add um, a slide here to uh, touch back to yesterday's talks about surface and um, because even though these are the objects that come from the artist's hands, they've gone through a lot of restoration because Degas didn't value them as finished objects in his own time. He valued them, but not as finished objects. So they were in a state of disrepair and had to be pulled uh, into uh, certain configurations for the, for the casting that occurred later. So, but that's also been published in our uh, journal Facture that the conservation division puts out. And then we have other objects at the gallery um, that are related to soap formations. And in fact, um, this Lick and Lather by Giannini Antoni is made, one version and is made of chocolate, and another version is actually made from soap, the topic of our session here today. And, um, and it presents that presents its own challenges. You'd think soaps would be perfectly stable. Perhaps later, if we have some time, we can um, go to the hyperlink. But I didn't, didn't tell Jan about this, but that is a link to a three and a half minute movie that the Smithsonian uh, created a few years ago, discussing what to do with their uh, lick and lather when the, the lather version reached the end of its life which was a topic that came up yesterday. So that might be interesting. Um, I wasn't, when Jen first asked me to talk about this, I started thinking about a slide about looking. And I was going to take it out, but I've put it back in. Because I think that, um, just as Francesca talks, we have to think about how we see. So if a work of art is born at this moment, it has a life, it has a trajectory. Eddington's arrow, says it goes only one way. Um, and that trajectory can take a number of paths depending on what happens to it. And Jen talked a little bit about that yesterday, about um, moments of disruption in the quiet, calm life of a work of art. But one of the things that I want to just add about the life of the work of art is that we are observers to it. And depending on our viewpoint, we see different things. And so, Early on in the lifetime, perhaps two observers see a work of art in a remarkably similar way. This might be um, an altarpiece in a church a hundred years after it was painted, and both the owner of the work and the parishioner see it rather similarly. And they're bringing all of their experiences to looking at that object. But as the object's life um, continues and our observation and our relationship to the work changes, we, we see a different work, um, even though the work was always one and the same. And our, perhaps at that point, our views begin to diverge because we're bringing so many different ways of looking at a work of art. So in terms of the life and the afterlife and the changes that are going on, I think we have to put, you know, put our minds behind our eyes and accept what we see um, and interpret what we see and, and uh, in terms of, of calling something degradation when it's just change or aging, we need to do that. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't problems. I mean, Francesca showed spalling and splitting and pustules forming, but sometimes it's just the result of chemical reactions and time. This painting looks great, though. Aris Kint is still not alive, 
but the painting is alive and well. So thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara. Um, do we have any questions for Barbara? Maybe we could ask me. All right, well, I just wanted to <laughs> quickly comment. I'm really glad that um, Barbara brought up uh, aluminum steroids and how they're interacting with all of the other steroids in the paint film. And I think these this morning's presentation showed that you would think paint films, a relatively simple system to understand, and in fact, major new discoveries are being made in how these materials are formulated and aging over time.